thanks for the introduction, Brent, um, and thanks everyone for having me. This is this is a real pleasure. Um, when I was making this PowerPoint, I realized this is since I got to Denison, this is only the second time that I've got to put assistant professor on a slide when talking to someone um, for presentations because everything has been so wacky, right? Um, so. Uh, just to get started uh, up front, I want to acknowledge that the content of this work has been contributions and um, funding and data that have come from a variety of different sources. And so some of that will be acknowledged both at the end, and I want to do it up front as well. Right, so just to give give you guys a broad introduction specifically for the undergrads in the room, I typically call myself a sedimentologist and stratigrapher. Um, in my work, I enjoy using a bunch of different tools and working across different timescales. So whether it's, you know, what we often consider the most fun parts, which is the field work, um, digging around in modern or recent deposits on the Mississippi River Delta or in other rivers around the world, or um, using some of this data to build predictive, simple, targeted models to understand the evolution of different kinds of landscapes, or really trying to, to understand the ancient, either by mapping in the field or using acoustic data sets, which I'll show some of it today, um, to understand the, the evolution of different landscapes. I love doing it all, but my first love has always been um, process analogs, flume experiments, where you, know, you get to play God a little bit, you get to set your boundary conditions, you get to control the influence of different boundary conditions on the, the experiments that you're running, whether you're looking at turbidity currents or whole shelf margins. Um, you can kind of tweak those boundary conditions and finally look at the stratigraphy and say, okay, this, these are the signals that actually made, made their way into the stratigraphy. This is how the surface evolved because of this one set of boundary conditions. And that's, that's really um, my, the thing that I love doing the most. Today, unfortunately, I'm not going to be talking about experiments at all, um, but I will be dealing with a bunch of field data. So just a brief roadmap. Um, I'll talk about what motivates my work overall. But specifically, I want to focus on large rivers and deltas because this is something I've been working on recently. I spent about three years on the Mississippi River Delta living and working in New Orleans for my postdoc. And I have an enduring love for the place and the environment. And it, it makes its way into my work quite a bit. Um, as we kind of wrap up talking about upstream and downstream controls on stratigraphy and sedimentation in the Mississippi River Delta, I also want to close with a bit of a reflection specifically once again for students in the room who are the future of the geosciences. I want to talk about a little bit um, of the current policies and practices in geosciences and how that might potentially influence who we include and how we go about excluding certain, uh, certain groups of people from the future of geosciences. Right, so just to get started, motivation. Broadly speaking, when I uh, work through trying to connect surface morphodynamics or the, the changing state of any surface system to its sedimentary archive, the broad overarching driver here is trying to bridge the gap between timescales, right? So anytime we think about building uh, adaptable systems, adaptive systems for uh, a system that's going to change in the coming years, decades, centuries, or millennia. We want to build the infrastructure. We want to accommodate changes that are going to occur over multiple generations. And often, the short time scales that we deal with when we think about engineering modifications to a system, these short time scales are, in fact, conditioned by long term geological trends. And so, understanding uh, the record that is left behind, but also the, the dynamics of the system that, that occur over these different time scales is really important to me. Secondly, you know, when we, when we go about building models to predict landscape change, we have one data set. It's a valuable data set. It's the sedimentary archive of, of the changes that have occurred on Earth through time. And learning how to use these predictive models that can then run for long periods of time generate the stratigraphy that we 
can then compare against Earth's archive is, is, is a powerful way of actually testing whether or not our understanding of natural processes is relevant to these long time scales. So specifically to what I'm going to be talking about today, um, the motivation for the work is very, very focused on applying these findings to understanding how deltas function. Okay, um, any delta, a big delta like the Mississippi is going to have this sort of fabric where you see channels, you see marshland, but the, the sediment in the delta is really a fundamental driver for the evolving fabric of this delta. So for instance, here you have channels with their levees. These are now the high grounds on the Mississippi River Delta. The spaces between the channels is where we're actively losing land right now because of compactional subsidence, because of sea level rise, uh, because of storm uh, erosion and so on. And so in order to understand whatever problems are related to these large river deltas, understanding the subsurface becomes really important, whether you care about, as I mentioned, subsidence rates, or you care about the movement of water. So with rising sea level, we have salt water intrusion. The sandy channels buried within the subsurface are the pathways where uh, intrusion will primarily occur. Right? And so in, in order to understand the connectivity of these pathways, we need to understand the channels themselves and how they came to be. So on the right here, what you see is um, a way of actually thinking about the subsurface. So these are many, many, many channels from a Triassic Delta, and they were imaged with, within an acoustic volume. And so what you're seeing is multiple time steps of channels moving around in space, all stacked one on top of the other. Okay, and so you can think about these as the, the art arteries or the pathways within which water and sediment moved during the active phase of the delta. And now the pathways within which fluids can move in the subsurface, again, within the sedimentary archive. So I'm gonna talk about a fundamental hydraulic control in these large river deltas, which is the backwater. So let's talk about what the backwater is really briefly. When we consider what happens to a river when it approaches the ocean, it, it, it slows down. We know that deltas form where the river slows down, where sediment is deposited. So what we're looking at here is the cross section in the downstream along the river channel. So this is the channel bed, this is the water surface. And as you start to get close to the ocean, what you end up seeing is the river goes from a surface that is roughly parallel to the channel bed, so this is the water surface and the river, to a situation where they're now di diverging. And this occurs because the river is starting to slow down. The water surface is now adjusting to the surface of the ocean that it's, it's meeting, right? Where this occurs, where the flow starts to slow down, where you start seeing this divergence, we call it the backwater zone, okay? The backwater zone is scaled usually by the depth of the river, divided by the slope. So you can imagine that a, a river with a very low slope, like the lowland Mississippi River, and a very deep channel will have a significant backwater length. Now, what gets really interesting is that the, this backwater zone behaves very differently depending on the discharge, okay? So this red line here now shows us that water level has gone up during a flood, in, the, in what we call the normal flow zone where these, these surfaces are parallel to each other. But what's interesting here is that that water surface also needs to adjust to mean sea level, right? And so within the backwater zone, you end up seeing a steepening of the water surface slope. Or in other words, the flow needs to accelerate across the backwater zone where it was originally slowing down. Here, it starts to accelerate across the black backwater zone. And so this results in some significant spatial and temporal variations in sediment transport. So here is an example of an actual measured uh, water surface slope during, the, during different discharges along the Mississippi River. So what you're seeing here is river kilometers above head of passes on the x-axis. So this is zero. This means that this is where the river meets the ocean. Going upstream all the way to, in this case, this is Cairo, Illinois far upstream. And what you're seeing here is the river bed 
and three instances of the water surface slope. So this is low flow, intermediate, and high flow. And you can see a significant steepening here. What's really interesting though about the Mississippi is that for a very small change in discharge from low flow to high flow, we see a significant change in sediment transport and sand discharge in the lowermost Mississippi. So this reach right here. This becomes really important because when we think about this, this means that there's periods of time when sand is just left behind as the flow slows down right here because the river is slowing down, so it's depositing. But there are also periods of time where the flow is accelerating, which means that it might actually be tran is transporting more material. But the long-term effects here are as, as sort of uh, held in the record of, of grain size on the riverbed is shown in this chart right here. So once again, we're looking at distance, but um, here we're looking at distance downstream from Cairo, Illinois. So this is where uh, the river meets the ocean. Now, you'll notice there are two lines, or rather uh, there's a colored line and a sloping line here. The sloping line is the average riverbed elevation. The blue line is water surface. And you'll notice that as the, as the uh, bed crosses, or rather drops below sea level, um, you notice that these dots here seem to uh, change in the way that they behave. These dots are the, the median grain size on the riverbed. So every river will show a, a downstream finding trend. But as we cross the backwater transition, that downstream finding becomes really exaggerated. Okay, and so this right here, where the river drops below sea level, or rather where the river bed drops below sea level, is usually where we pin the upstream extent of the backwater zone. So that's the backwater length right there. And so this downstream, exaggerated downstream fining, is deemed to be the result of coarse grain sediment being left behind at this transition. So that then raises the question, right? where is the sediment being stored? In any river, if you start increasing the rate of deposition, you're either storing that sediment on the riverbed or in the river bars, right? And so that can result in what we call super elevation or the river rapidly aggrades due to storage in the bed. And there have been other studies that show that at this backwater transition, in a lot of deltas around the world, the most recent avulsions seem to be tied to um, exaggerated storage of sediment on the bed. So in other words, the river is filling up its channel and getting to the point that it can easily evolve into its floodplain. But what I'm going to be fo focusing on here is sediment storage in bars. So here, um, when we think about, you know, what could be the consequences of storing a bunch of sediment in sandbars along the Mississippi River, the first thing that most geomorphologists think about is if you increase sand storage in bars, that means you're increasing the rate of migration, okay? And so we're actually gonna walk through a data set here that shows exactly that. So we're gonna be looking at two different rivers. One is the Mississippi, okay? This goes all the way up to about 500 uh, kilometers upstream, which is roughly here. Um, and sorry, this is the Trinity River, which is roughly here on the Mississippi. The Trinity River in Texas is a much smaller river, but both of them, when they get close to the ocean, show an increase in channel migration. So the river is now leaving a bunch of sediment in its bars. The river channel tends to narrow. As a result, flow ends up eroding a lot of material from the outer bank and driving lateral migration this way. So there's a feedback between sediment storage and overall uh, river kinematics. Now, because you're leaving a bunch of sediment behind in the backwater zone, you're also depleting the supply of sediment downstream. And so in the Mississippi, what we see is, you see that increase in river migration rate and a rapid decrease in river migration rate downstream. That then brings us to another question, right? So if you're leaving sediment behind, you're changing the grain size in the bars, does that mean that you might potentially be 
changing the geometry of the river cross section or changing the geometry of the bars. And so I'll walk through that in, in just a little bit, but to highlight for you what, what we're gonna be doing, we're gonna be looking at the Mississippi River. Here's a bunch of mapped river bars all along the river channel. And we're actually going to be looking at the river uh, cross section to analyze what the, the cross sectional slope is on these bars. So why would the, the cross-sectional slope, or the transverse slope of bars change? If you think about what controls the slope of a bank attached bar in a river, it comes down to grain size and velocity. So let's walk through that just right here. So when we think about it, anytime you have bed load being, can everyone see me gesturing? Sorry, give me a second. Right, so if we imagine sediment hopping downstream along a bar, right? It's moving as bed load, it's hopping along. Um, what controls whether or not it can stay on the river bed hopping along downstream at the same elevation, moving along a transverse slope? So the bar has a transverse slope, but the grains are moving downstream. That's ultimately going to be controlled by how steep that slope is, that transfer slope, and what the velocity is that's driving that sediment to move downstream, right? So that's going to be tied to flow velocity. <clears throat> ultimately, what it comes down to is the gravitational effects that could potentially pull the sediment down slope or pull the sediment down into the talweg of the river channel is going to be set by how steep that transfer slope is but also how large the grain sizes are. So the larger grain sizes would be more likely to slide to the bottom of that slope, right? If the slope was steeper, likewise sediment would be more likely not to be able to move across that transverse slope. Conversely, if you deal with, you know, what might be the resisting force that allows sediment to move downstream along a transverse slope, that's gonna be all about the uh, cross stream component of flow in any curved channel. So this is gonna be contributed by the centrifugal force, which is directly related to the curvature of the channel. It's also going to be related to the velocity of the water. And so ultimately, if we sort of imagine these two forces are balanced, we can then say, okay, the transfer slope of the bar is directly proportional to the square of the flow velocity it's inversely proportional to the square of the grain size, assuming we're dealing with uh, a range of bends that have similar curvatures. So that's what we're gonna look at now. What we're, what we're gonna do is we're looking at river kilometers from the outlet all the way upstream to about 500 river kilometers. That river kilometers just means along the winding river channel. We've got transverse bar slope, We've got grain size on the bed, and we've got a couple of different discharges up here. So on the bottommost chart, what we're seeing here is that as we enter the backwater zone, you begin to see a steepening of the cross stream slope of bars. And then it's, it get the, that, that sort of trend seems to fall apart a little bit. But what's interesting is that steepening seems to be related to the coarsest fraction that's on the bed. And so where we lose the coarsest material or what I often refer to as perennial bed load, um, we start to see a, a steepening of the bar surface. And so the question is, is it, related to the steep, uh, is it related to the grain size or is it related to the velocity, right? Based on this uh, relationship. So let's look at what happens with velocity. Most sand movement on the lower Mississippi occurs during high flow. So we want to specifically look at these higher discharge or higher water velocity markings right here. And you'll notice that in this area where we see the steepening of the bar slopes, we don't actually see much of a change in water velocity. We see the acceleration far downstream down here. And so I walk away from the, the, this data set and I say, okay, that means that the, the velocity seems to not have as much an impact on the cross stream slope of bars, but the particle size seems to have more of an impact. That still kind of raises the question, is this just a Mississippi thing or is this a more universal thing, right? 
And so once again, we're looking at the Trinity River as well. What we've done is we're comparing the two rivers here by non-dimensionalizing the x-axis. So we're taking river kilometers upstream and dividing that by the backwater length for each river. And what we see is that in both cases, we, we see this gradual increase in slope till, till you know, where the slope seems to not change very much further downstream. Um, and our contention is this, is this is directly related to the grain size. So that downstream, exaggerated downstream fining is now expressed in a steepening of the bar surface slopes. It doesn't exactly tell us why anyone would care. I'll tell you why you might care. So here is, um, you know, when we think about channels and how they're preserved in the stratigraphic record, a channel belt at the outcrop scale is usually preserved as these sort of bar accretion sets, sl sloping surfaces that are associated with stacked bar forms in the stratigraphic record. And what this gives us at, at this scale where we're saying, okay, the bar surface slope changes. If you go out into the field and you map hundreds of bars across, you know, whatever spatial scale is available to you, you can get a sense of whether you're potentially changing, consistently changing the straddle geometries on the way to the basin, which might suggest then that if there's a steepening, you're probably within the backwater zone. And if there's no change, well, you're probably within the normal flow zone. And so something like this is something that you can actually go out into the field and use when you're placing yourself within the, the larger, larger scale of a system. Right, so that talked a little bit about decadal scale impacts and sediment dynamics on river kinematics, um, you know, the finer scale bar geometry type stuff. But let's kind of step back and look at the long term uh, impacts. When I say long term, I mean millennial scale. So now we're looking at thousands of years. We're going to be specifically looking at two different systems, the Mississippi and the Rhine. So right now, what we're going to do is focus specifically on the Mississippi. When we sort of think about the Mississippi, usually when we deal with the Holocene system, we look specifically at the reach that goes from Cairo, Illinois, all the way down to Head of Passes. For anyone who's been there, New Orleans is right here. That's where the Crescent City is nestled within that bend. Old River Control Structure, which is where the Atchafalaya um, offshoot of the Mississippi River Channel is, is right here. So this data set is essentially a map of the most recent channel belt associated with the Mississippi, Mississippi River. The green that you see here uh, is essentially uh, the, the width of the channel belt all the way from Cairo, Illinois to Head of Passes. So all the way from up there down here. At the top, what we see sorry, at the top, the red dots are uh, the same sort of migration rates, but now cast in a slightly different horizontal framework, which is just the distance along the channel belt axis. And so once again, you see that increase in lateral migration rates and a decrease downstream. When we think about now how this sort of change in lateral migration rates might affect the shape of the channel belt, Straight off the bat, we can see that the channel belt narrows quite significantly once you enter the backwater reach, whereas it doesn't change very much upstream. Furthermore, if you look at how the dimensions might change in terms of thickness, what we're looking at down here are the thickness of the channel belt as, as estimated using oxbow lake fills. So when a channel jumps across its floodplain, it leaves a mud-filled channel behind. And estimating the thickness of that gives us a sense of how thick this channel belt is. In the very distant backwater reach, there are no oxbow lakes, which is a direct result of the fact that the river doesn't migrate very much. And so there we just use the thicknesses of bars. So we estimate the thickness of the channel belt using the bar thickness right there. And so what you see here is that, you know, commensurate with this decrease in lateral migration rate, which over long time scales generates a narrowing of the channel belt. We also see a deepening or a thickening of the channel belt, which I would say is a direct result of long term starvation of sediment on the bed. So the river during high flow just persistently scours out these distal reaches. 
And the final record is just a thicker channel belt as a result, but also a narrower channel belt. So if that works for the Mississippi, the question is, does this work in other systems? So here we're going to be looking at data that has been uh, a-dimensionalized for two different rivers. So we have the Mississippi River in gray and three channel belts from the Rhine system, which is a much smaller system uh, from the Netherlands. And we did the same thing. I non-dimensionalized the distance upstream by the estimated backwater length. When it came to comparing the widths of these systems, I non-dimensionalized the channel belt width by the uh, estimated channel width. And so what we see is that the data collapses quite nicely within the backwater reach, which then would suggest that, you know, if you're, if you're not dealing with tremendously different background conditions like tides or waves and so on, uh, these channel belt dimensions seem to hold good across systems of different scales. Let's take it a step further now and look at the actual composition of the channel belts. So here we have two cross sections uh, from the Mississippi region where we have one cross section up here near Vicksburg, another down here very close to Head of Passes. Now I want you guys to focus in on uh, the blue hatched marks. The blue is the fine grained, easily suspended material from within the channel belt. So it's fine sand, silt, clay usually. It's what uh, a sedimentologist would refer to as very heterolithic. Up near Vicksburg, or further upstream, I should say, a large fraction of the, of the channel belt thickness is occupied by coarser material. Okay, and so this is usually anywhere up to, uh, up to gravel size. There's a little bit of a cautionary note here. The Mississippi up here is sitting right on top of Pleistocene braided river deposits. And so the Army Corps of Engineers is not really able to differentiate between the two kinds of deposition, but we can estimate that the thickness of the current Mississippi Channel Belt should be approximately um, in, in line with these Oxbow Lake fields, which are right here. Okay, so if you look at this cross section, then we say that the fine grained material in terms of thickness contributes very small amounts of sediment to the overall thickness of the channel belt, right? Whereas far downstream, it pretty much makes up the whole thickness of the channel belt. And so what this would suggest then is that this hydro hydrodynamic phenomenon, the backwater, creates very systematic um, trends in channel body dimensions, width, thickness, as well as the lithology, the content, the sediment within the channels. If we take it a little bit further now, let's see how this holds up when we think about longer timescales, the stratigraphy of larger systems over million year timescales now. So what we're looking at here is the Munguru system. This is a large Triassic Delta, very similar in scale to the Mississippi. And like I said earlier in the talk, all of these things that seem to look like arteries are multiple channel belts that have stacked up through time and been mapped in seismic data. So these are about 700 channel belts. If, if you kind of imagine yourself with X-ray vision and kind of looking into the surface of the Delta, the channels would show up in black, everything else that is mud rich floodplain would be invisible and you would get something like this. All of this represents about 2 million years of deposition. Okay, and it's about 300 meters thick. So that's a significant thickness relative to the Holocene Delta that we were just looking at. Furthermore, in this particular case, we had, we've uh, using um, other data other than the sedimentology, we know that we had minor, uh, minor sea level fluctuations on, on the order of about 10 meters, which compared to the river depth is relatively small because our estimated depths for these rivers were about 50 meters or thereabouts. For anyone who hasn't spent much time looking at seismic data, we often use this type of acoustic imaging, acoustic imaging to map out these different channels. So that's what a channel belt would look like shown in yellow right here, but you can see the pattern quite nicely in, in plan view. Right, so if we 
Now think about how this system might potentially compare to the Mississippi. This is a similar plot to what you've seen earlier. We plot distance upstream from in the Munguru, this would be where we know the front of the delta was. Uh, in the Mississippi, we actually know where the, the river outlet was. And we've estimated backwater length for the Munguru and non-dimensionalized this x-axis to compare these systems. So this is all 700 um, channel belts from the Munguru plotted in gray. And you'll notice that their widths don't really change very much, but they, they're comparable to the Mississippi in general. So a data set like this, I mean, is pretty spectacular by, by normal standards. Even so, there's a lot of missing information. For instance, we don't know what these, what these channel belts look like up there. We don't know what the front of the delta looks like, uh, what sedimentation through time might have looked like out front, none of that. So all we know, or all we can take away from this is that it's likely that all of those 700 channel belts were contained within the backwater reach. Now, if we look at the lithology within those channel belts, for anyone who's not familiar with looking at gamma ray data, um, typically your gamma ray data, uh, as is shown here when, when it's pink, gamma ray data tends to, uh, tends to show an excursion to the left when, you, when you're dealing with sand. It shows an excursion to the right when you're dealing with shales or clays. And so here, all of the sands as mapped are uh, in, in these gamma ray logs in different wells in the, in, in, in the Munguru have been highlighted in pink. And so as you go from upstream to downstream, what we see is that sand thickness seems to change downstream. So the mapped sands seem to just get thinner downstream. They also seem to get less blocky. So you see these really nice blocky channel belts up here they get kind of, um, I, don't, I don't really know what word to use here, but it, they, they just, they would suggest that your sand beds are now much thinner and much more interspersed with fine grained material. So shales, or, or in a modern system, you would, you would see a lot of mud drapes and clays. So overall, what this might suggest if we compare the two is that even though we're looking at a couple of million years of information here, all compressed within within this one transect. Um, what we can say is that these trends, broadly speaking, where we see sand rich channel belts upstream, more heterolithic channel belts downstream seem to be very similar to what we see in the Mississippi, where we see sand rich channel belts upstream, more heterolithic de deposition downstream or silt and clay rich deposition downstream. So why might this, this, this be interesting here? So something that I take away from this is, well, initially I was just amazed that we could see these trends over millions of years of deposition where you know that sea level has changed, you know that um, any number of external factors could have changed. And so an important takeaway is that in these large river systems where you have a wide backwater zone. The backwater zone has the potential to act as a filter where the filter just sort of sticks around and constantly mediates how much sediment and what the caliber of sediment is that is delivered downstream to the channels downstream as well as to the fronts of the deltas and beyond, right? The second is that in spite of sea level perturbations, if those perturbations are of the amplitudes are relatively small compared to the channel depth, there's every likelihood that the preserved stratigraphy is gonna not hold a record of, of these perturbations. In other words, um, the, the backwater zone in this case is acting as, as a buffer for sea level perturbations. And it, it doesn't really affect the final result, the final stratigraphy that we see. And this, you know, for a whole host of reasons, if you think about the geological time scales and the flux of sediment and organic material to the oceans over geological time scales and the global um, impacts of that, it's all, it all gets quite cool at that point. So those were the key points from, from this, this, this sort of the backquarter oriented portion of the talk. Um, I wanted to move on and talk a little bit about some of the stuff that I've been doing with colleagues in the last year. And just so everyone knows, the, the, the subsequent portions of this talk have been contributed to significantly by uh, Dr. Antoinette Abeta, um, Dr. Robert Main, and Dr. Travis Swanson.
all of us have been working together um, with undergraduate students for the past couple of years. And there's some outcomes that I wanted to talk about here. So first of all, we, I, I think across the board, everyone recognizes the importance of an REU. Um, it integrates students into the research endeavor. It brings students who might otherwise not have considered geosciences into the fold. Um, the downsides though, is that the downside is that most REUs as advertised tend to ask for students to relocate. And that creates significant barriers for a lot of students who have family or cultural obligations at home, who cannot afford to leave their jobs for an extended amount of time, um, who have you know, uh, children or elderly parents to take care of and so on. And so the current way that we structure our REUs needs, I think, needs to be looked at, and especially post COVID where we, many of us have switched gears and managed our students remotely. Um, we know that it's possible to do good research maybe not the way we would love to do it, but it is possible to do good research th through a, a different kind of model. And so what we tried out in 2019, this was before COVID, which is why everyone's standing so close together. Um, uh, we designed a short directed field campaign. This was funded by NSF, where we took students down to the Mississippi River Delta from four different universities. It was Denison, it was Georgia Southern, uh, University of New Orleans and, and New Mexico Gallup. The students all came together. We, we carried out a bunch of field work uh, oriented towards research data collection. So the students were getting hands-on training in the field. Furthermore, um, the funding covered you know, field gear stipends. Uh, the students were reimbursed for their labor, all of the food, travel, lodging, et cetera, was covered. Um, and our feedback from the students was that that helped a great deal for them to know that all of that was going to be covered and that they would not have to be spending out of their pockets to to array themselves with the right gear to be able to function well in the field. Um, subsequently, during our summer uh, REU, we sort of calculated all the numbers that were relevant for for the final report here, and it was quite encouraging and that being able to provide the basic financial support that a lot of students need to be able to participate in this and being able to say a lot of this data can be processed at home at your home institutions we will remotely mentor you through the process ultimately resulted in, in a much higher representation of both uh, diverse racial and ethnic groups as well as more women in the research endeavor than would normally be seen across the geosciences um, and so one of the takeaways here is that the current REU program or the REU structure that we often like to use may not work in all circumstances. And it actually does a good job of self-selecting in such a way that students with um, social obligations at home often cannot participate as a result. Um, Additionally, we so while we were sort of in the process of designing what we hoped to be an inclusive or a, a very strongly inclusive REU endeavor, um, we realized that no one had ever actually sat down to calculate the cost of participation outside of tuition related costs or organizational costs for field campaigns. And so we did that. When I say we, I want to, uh, I want to emphasize that this work was led by Antoinette Abita. Um, and so, what we're looking at here now is just the initial investment, assuming that there's no um, cultural familiarity with fieldwork, that, that the students present do not already have the gear that a lot of us as faculty now take for granted, right? So the simple stuff, if, you, if all you're doing is buying that simple, sorry, I think that's, right. Um, if all you're doing is buying that initial initial basic field field kit, a median expense that you would be investing is something close to $500. As a faculty member on a faculty salary, I would notice if I had to spend $500 of my own money to, to outfit myself to be in the field. Furthermore, there are social aspects depending on institutional support 
depending on whether or not you have a job at home, whether or not you have dependents, there's a compounding series of costs that can ultimately make this a really expensive endeavor and therefore prohibitive. And so this, I imagine this sort of conversation to be something that should involve anyone that's in the process of constructing field budgets, whether it's for a research campaign that is designed to be inclusive or whether it's for a field education uh, experience, depending on who we choose to serve, how we financially support our students becomes really important. Um, and so some ideas for potentially making making field work more accessible could be, you know, lending libraries of field gear or stipends for forfeited wages and dependent care um, or adjusting field work expectations, depending on the community that our university serves. Furthermore, being aware that the women in the group, this chart, tend, this chart on the right tends to make a lot of people quite upset, depending on whether or not you choose to buy women's clothing or whether you need to buy women's plus size clothing, these expenses can really pile up. So on average, women pay anywhere from 100 to $300 more than their male peers. So final takeaways here are that we need to look at geosciences. We, we know that the geoscience uh, field experience are integral to proper training for our students. How we support our students ultimately is gonna affect who makes it into the program, who continues and persists in the program and who can afford to finally be a, a, a geologist or a geoscientist. So with that, I just wanted to acknowledge all of my collaborators and funding agencies and to thank you all for listening. <laughs>